Well, it probably was a bit of a bombshell, the news today, that Kane Williamson no longer wants to continue as captain at the test match level anyway with the Black Caps. Apparently, he's still happy to captain the side in the white ball games, T20 and the ODIs, the 50 over matches, but not in test cricket. I think many probably would have thought if Kane was going to relinquish some of his duties, it probably would have been that he, he wouldn't play T20 or 50 over cricket and concentrated on test cricket, but it's if anything, it's the opposite. Uh, Ken Rutherford uh, with me again, back on the air with us from uh, Canberra, where he lives and works these days. What do you make of this, Ken? Does it uh, add up to you? No, not really. Uh, you, you wonder about the, the foresight and, and the plan- planning that's gone on behind the scenes. Uh, but clearly, from Kane's perspective, uh, he, he, he he's kind of He's earned the right to, to, to call time when and when he wants to in terms of his captaincy, whether it be white ball, red ball, whatever form of the game he, he wishes to. He's, he's got the runs on the board, so to speak, in terms of his overall contribution to New Zealand cricket. But I'm just trying to think, Brendan, last time we played a test match, it's, it's a while ago now, um, and you would have thought that the review process after that would have been well and, uh, and truly concluded by then. If any change of captaincy or personnel and other facets of the game were, were required that those decisions would have been made a long time ago so the timing just doesn't quite fit with me I, that spur of the moment I'm not so sure Kane doesn't seem the type of personality isn't the spur of the moment kind of stuff so it's clearly something that he's been dwelling on for some time but but your point around the white ball v red ball I, I would have thought um, he, he'd be sort of play we want to continue his, his red ball uh, dynasty his career the the legacy he's going to leave in the game from a playing and captaincy perspective for as long as he possibly could. Um, his T20 position in the team has, quite rightly, I think, been questioned in the last uh, couple of months. Uh, I, I could have seen him, foreseen him, uh, perhaps stepping mm. down from, from the T20 captaincy and the team, uh, and maybe the 50 over team as well in the next uh, couple of years. But his career, I would have thought he would have wanted to continue. We'll get on, we'll get on to the appointment of Tim Southey as opposed to the non-appointment of Tom Latham in a moment. But is there an issue there for Southey, for example, as the new captain, having the previous captain out there on the field while he's the new captain trying to stamp his authority and his mark on it? I think it's easier for Tim being captain uh, with Kane there than, than for Tom. I think Tom may have felt that uh, Kane had a weary eye over over his shoulder looking at the way way things have been running on the field. But Tim's known Kane for a, for a long, long time. They go back to age group teams in, in the northern districts from probably when they were 13, 14 years of age, Brendan. So, I, and they're really good mates. So I, I can't see that being a okay. problem. I probably think that's. I probably think think that's one of the reasons why they've gone for Southie ahead of Latham because they, they New Zealand cricket sees a possible transition process being quite a quite a simple one. And every situation is different, of course. But I I do note that uh, Root seems very comfortable, doesn't he, under Ben Stokes? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I was actually mm. thinking that as well. There's, mm. there's be no issue there, and uh, if anything, the team in English terms has prospered from having perhaps still having some Root influence in the background. Uh, it's, it's quite notable. Uh, one of the key decisions in terms of a bowling change, uh, Stokes made note of of that decision being very much Joe Root's decision. So he's still calling on Joe Root's expertise mm. out in the field as Stokes. And I'd imagine that Southie, particularly when Southie's bowling, look, I, I wasn't much of a bowler. I got one test wicket, a full toss and leg stumped it straight to mid wicket. Larry Gomes, our luckiest batsman of all time. But uh, I can imagine when you're in the middle of a long spell of bowling, the last thing you want to be really doing is, is thinking too intricately about field placement. So I'd imagine your, your senior professionals in the team, the likes of Kane, who's still there, and, and Latham, etc., will be helping Southie out in that respect. Yeah, very interesting. So do you think under Tim Southey there will be a different look about the way the Black Caps play their cricket? Are they thinking that they've got to go down the road that McCullum's taken England? What sort of captain is Southey? Is he conservative in your books or is he more likely to take a risk than, say, Kane Williamson? No, he'll have a crack. And I think that's another reason why they've they've gone for Tim. He'll have a crack. He'll look to be attacking you look to show some adventure. Um, Latham, for mine, when you when we looked at his particular his captaincy, the Trent Bridge Test match, he's, he's quite conservative, quite Kane Williamson esque, if you like, in terms of the way he goes about things. So there wouldn't have been too much of a change. You go back to this calendar year, Brendan, uh, the, the New Year's Day Test match of Mount Monganui. Let's think back to that. It's only about what uh, 11 and a half months ago. Now we lost that Test match to Bangladesh, captained by Tom Latham. 
Uh, then we came back to win the last two test matches of that series and win the series against Bangladesh. But our performances over the last, probably since we won the test championship back a good couple of years now, have been indifferent. And uh, I think if you categorise uh, the way we've been playing, it has been quite conservative, quite cagey, quite defensive almost in terms of the way we've gone about it. And um, I think you'll find that it's in a Southeast personality to play a bit more attackingly, to be more adventurous. You know, I think that's a chance for us now to perhaps look at the test matches come up this summer and say, well, we're actually going to have a crack. We're going to be a bit more attacking our approach. And I think it's mm. a good positive mindset change for the team. Do you think Tom, Lay- Tom, Tom Latham has a right to feel that he's been snubbed a bit here? No, he doesn't. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, I don't. And he shouldn't feel like that. He's. I actually did a quick look at his, his, his record as a batsman, Brendan, which really surprised me. So in the nine test matches that he's captain New Zealand, you take it at 252 against Bangladesh, I think it was at Hagley Oval in January this year, he's, he's averaging around 14 in his other 13 completed oh, knocks okay. as, as a captain. So his, his form has been pretty dire in the captaincy role, far more surprisingly so than... than and when you first look at it, it's cause his average is not bad, but you take it at 252. Look, I'm, I'm a sports starter these days, Brendan, so you learn to, <laughs> yeah. to disregard the either ends of the bell curve, yeah. if you know what I mean. So, yeah. you know, the, the sample size is big enough to, to conclude that Tom's form as a, as a as a batsman, as captain, isn't that flash. So that would have played a part to play as well. Now, he's got no reason to feel... Uh, undermined or you know condemned or anything like that, he's still got a vital part to play. His record as a overall batsman in New Zealand cricket history as an opening bat is, is terrific. Although the fact, as you mentioned, he has led the uh, silver, uh, led the um, uh, Black Caps in nine Test matches uh, in recent years, and so I suppose mm. he probably would think in the privacy of his own thoughts that I'm being groomed here. If and when Kane moves on, uh, well, he has moved on from the captaincy, but he hasn't got the job. So it would be perfectly natural I would have thought if he does feel a little slightly peeved that uh, he's missed out on this job I suppose there's a few other perks that come with being captain isn't there as well yeah probably is but no I think he's been given the chance and I, I watched a lot of the uh, English series New Zealand uh, and William, look, Williamson captain the first couple of test matches I think Latham took over that Trent Bridge test match and there was a, there was a couple of points in that test match at Trent Bridge where uh, I, I thought the captaincy let us down, particularly after T. I I think it was the last day when Bearstow was batting and, and Matt Henry was bowling short stuff to a, to a short leg side boundary. It was literally only about a 55 metre hit to the boundary. And Bearstow, in, 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 basically in the space of 20 to 30 minutes, changed that course of the game. It went from being very much in the balance to England winning in an absolute canter. And you've got to look at your captain, you've got to look at what the coach is also saying to the, to the captain at tea time in that match and saying, how can you get the tactics so darn wrong? And and that, that really struck alarm bells for me, sound alarm bells for me. And uh, the other thing I noted about Latham's captaincy too was it was kind of by committee at times. Often you'd see at the start of a bowler's run-up, it would say it was Henry bowling or Wagner bowling. There'd be like a little committee meeting. You'd have Southey in there, you'd have the bowler, you'd have a couple of other senior players, and then the whole game was sort of ground to a halt. It was like the captain was getting ideas from left, right and centre. So oh, okay. uh, yeah. there, there, were, there were a few alarm bells there for mine around Latham's captaincy. Now, he's had, he's had his chance. He had four test wins, a couple against Bangladesh, would you expect us to, to win? One against the poor West Indies side a couple of years ago, and one good win against England in England about a year or so ago. So he's had his chance. I think Southie's a good call. But Southie's 34. I mean, it's, it's yeah. not a long-term call. So who's being groomed next? Well, it's, that's right. It's yeah, probably I mean, only it... someone like a... Maybe a Daryl Mitchell, maybe. I don't, I don't know, but it's, it's 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 probably not going to be Latham. Uh, well, he's thirty, so he's four years younger than Tim Southey, and Tim Southey, being a fast bowler, is likely to uh, retire from Test cricket earlier than, say, an opening batsman. Um, so, yeah, that's another unusual Correct. decision. It can't be a long-term choice with uh, Tim Southey, and he joins. So, so Williamson joins this list of players. First choice players for Test cricket in New Zealand that have departed the scene in recent times. And Bolt, we know, is only mm. interested in the short version of the game. Jimmy Neesham has gone. Uh, Colin de Grandholm has gone. And I suppose you might throw Martin Guptill in there, but I think it was clear made to him that uh, his yeah. future was finished anyway in, in t- Test cricket and probably even in the limited over form. And now Williamson. Um, should we yeah. read anything into this number of first choice players leaving basically Test cricket mm. in some shape or form? Well, I think the, the macro problem that New Zealand cricket is, is, is facing and, and really has faced the last two or three years is 
you know, what do they do with their overall contract uh, system? Um, it, it clearly isn't really working and, and isn't really up to date in modern times in terms of what the modern cricketer is, is after in terms of these short term contracts which are occurring. Uh, I think it's a major issue for New Zealand cricket and uh, you, you, you really got to look now at um, what the depth is actually like in, in, in the next group of players coming through and having seen some of the action from that New Zealand A tour to India about three or four months ago, if that's our next best coming through, I think we've got a few concerns, Brian, quite frankly. We've had this golden generation all of around that Tim Southey, Kane, Williamson era. You can go back to uh, an under-19 World Cup back in 2008-2009 in Malaysia when these players were all you know, late teens. And that group, including the likes of Trent Bolt, Corey Anderson, BJ Watling and others, have now vanished or are vanishing. Mm. And um, there's a real concern now about that next group coming through because if you look at the New Zealand A team that went to India recently, they actually were a lot of young guys there. They were all in their sort of late 20s, journeyman first-class cricketers, yeah, yeah. Who, who, who do okay. But the, are, they, but, are they really going yeah, to be international quality cricketers in the next five or six years? Well, that's right. I, I mean, think, once you yeah. once you once you get into the uh, say test side, it still then takes isn't it two or three seasons at least before you can prove yourself le- at that level. And if you haven't, you've probably gone. So, yeah, that, that's right. in- interesting times ahead for New Zealand cricket. Anyway. Uh, Ken, thank you very much indeed. You've given us a, quite a few things to think about there, which we will. And um, I'll let you get back to your data, your data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll look at bell curves, mate, so I know exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't try and explain them to me, mate, because we'll be here all afternoon. But uh, uh, good, okay. to talk, good to talk some cricket with you anyway, uh, Ken, and thanks once again for your time. Appreciate it. No problem.